as always, uh, when I start a book, I have ideas for characters. I have a few visual images. I have a few ideas of who they are and what they look like. But those are just sort of little smatterings. You know, you build upon that. With this one, the first characters who came to me, I found them so interesting that I knew I wanted to spend a very long time with them. I knew that three years, four years would not be enough. One book would not be enough. You know, one of the worst things about being a novelist is that when you finish a book, uh, you know, you have to take leave of your characters. You know, some of them die or whatever. Uh, and that's actually an incredibly wrenching thing when you've been living with these people who, in your head, are completely real, as real as your friends, as real to me as you are, uh, you know. And then suddenly a day comes when the book is out of your hands and uh, you just have to say goodbye to them. That's completely wrenching, you know. And uh, one of the reasons why I decided to write uh, this thing over 10 years was precisely so that I could live with these characters for a very long time, you know, just to see how their lives evolved, to see the ways in which their lives uh, sort of were enmeshed with each other. Also, I knew at that point that I wanted to do something really ambitious, you know, something that would really test me, that would push me. Because as a writer or, you know, just as a human being, sometimes you reach an age when it's easy to become lazy. You know, it's easy to just rest on your laurels and not push yourself. And I think that happens, you know, with artists of every kind, that sometimes you just uh, succumb to temptation to take it easy and just to travel to festivals and do nothing else and you know and it's, that's a perfectly easy thing to do nowadays you know so I didn't want to take that route at all I wanted to push myself I wanted to stretch my boundaries you know I wanted to push myself beyond my own limits and I certainly succeeded in doing that I mean this last year when I was finishing this last book which was in a way the most challenging book of the whole lot I really often thought that I must have been mad to start down this path, you know. And then again, you know, uh, Herman Melville, who I greatly admire, uh, once, uh, once said, you know, uh, that to write a great book, you must set yourself a great task, you know. And I really do think that, that, is, uh, uh, that that's true. You know, you have to set yourself something very big to do. Otherwise, uh, you know, one flinches. You know, one, one falters and one flinches. So, you know, now I feel that, I, I feel an incredible sense of fulfillment and also relief that, you know, I was able to see it through till the end. Amitabh, you've enriched our lives with all the work that you've done and just, just hearing you. you talk about um, the process is just, is just so wonderful to get a glimpse into, uh, you're a private person, so it's wonderful to get a glimpse into that process. Uh, allied to this is one more question, technical. Did you plot all three books roughly in terms of where you wanted it to go to, like it'll end with the opium war, or is it something that as you were writing book one, book two began to form in your head? Uh, believe me, uh, I, I didn't even plot as far as the end of the first chapter <laughs> when I began. I, but I'm not, you know, there are writers who have these elaborate plots. Yeah, they have these so, boards with all these yeah. markers and colors and things on them. That's not me. I mean, I sort of flounder along, you know, <laughs> and I flounder and flounder and flounder. And, and then produce masterpieces, of course, <laughs> floundering. You know, uh, literally, I, I, I literally don't know from, uh, from chapter to chapter what's going to happen next. But then again, you know, I've been writing for a long time. So a certain kind of native intelligence creeps in. So you plant little threads, you plant little subplots. And I realize now how, how clever I was, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> there were lots of little threads I could draw out. There were lots of little threads I did not cut off, which I was tempted to cut off. So, you know... Um, yeah, so uh, in a way, now I can see that this trilogy was always destined to end where it ends. But even when I started writing this book, I had no idea, absolutely no idea. So through the previous two novels, uh, sorry, though the previous two novels in the trilogy have been set, uh, you know, hundreds of hundred years ago or more, there are parallels through those novels that one is constantly, as one's reading, we're drawing to the present day whether it's migration, whether it's um, seeking, seeking a new life elsewhere, uh, cynically indulging in commerce uh, in another country, the forging of a hybrid cultural identity that happens once one moves to a new land, the tumult of a country overrun by immigrants from different nations. There are very clear parallels that the, write, that the reader, um, if he's you know, decently educated, he or she, you start making these invisible and un unconscious parallels. 
So we now know, of course, from what you've read, that the flood of fire takes us into the genesis and then the heart of the first opium war. What parallels, obvious and otherwise, would you make from this novel to present day? Uh, interesting question. Uh, you know, uh, William Faulkner famously said, uh, the past is not over, the past is not even past. You know, and that's really true. Uh, I think the opium wars, one of the reasons why they're so important, and uh, you know, it seems strange to me that they're so neglected, is because they really laid the foundations of uh, the modern world. You know, the world today would be unimaginable without the opium wars. I mean, the opium wars created modern China as it is. The opium wars uh, really created uh, some of the most important cities uh, of the modern world, Singapore, Hong Kong, Shanghai. All of this goes back to the opium war. So, you know, there's such a direct sort of line of descent from there. But what is most striking to me is that the opium war was really a bookend at one end. Uh, and at the other end of that, you have these American wars in Iraq. You know, both of these wars are fought in, along very similar principles. Uh, on the name, in the name of free trade, even the sort of, um, uh, the sort of discourse that accompanies them, you know. Uh, in the Opium Wars, they kept saying, the British kept saying, oh, we will be welcomed with uh, joss sticks and garlands when we arrive in China, which proved not to be the case, just as it was not the case in Iraq, you know. But the same sorts of primal delusions, you know, delusions about the nature of the market, about the nature of commerce, uh, you see that uh, so profoundly, you know, running through this entire period. A period in which, really, the Anglo-American empire, if you like, has really molded the world in its own image, where we all now worship this fetish of growth and free trade. And, uh, you know, there can be no doubt that it's going to lead, uh, as it already has led in many ways, uh, to disaster, you know. So I do see the opium, the opium wars as being the foundation of this period uh, in the most important sense of what you might call a kind of a mass delusion about the nature of economy, about the nature of the values in human life, about what is important in human life. And uh, what did opium and the opium wars, how did they convulse India at the time? And are we still seeing uh, the effects, the fruit or otherwise of that today? Uh, you know, the effects of, op of opium on India were not as profound as they were on China. On China, of course, uh, you know, they created, as, if you like, mass destitution. They created uh, all kinds of social problems. But at the same time, one thing we often forget is that uh, opium addiction was very widespread in 18th and 19th century India. And not just amongst Indians. Most of the colonial officials who were... Uh, uh, who were in India, uh, you know, they dabbled in opium, they took opium, they, gam uh, you know, they, of course, invested in opium, but many of them actually took opium, and there are many instances of, uh, you know, even British soldiers taking opium. But you alluded to um, empires being built, industrial empires being built on, uh, on, this op on the opium wars and the trade. So, in India, uh, what are we seeing of those empires and, and, you know, when we look around, like you said, this building is probably half the proceeds of this, of the, you know, from opium have probably funded this building. So are there some foundational, uh, can we look around this country and say that was because of the opium war and this, I mean, are there uh, in, in, in industries or houses or people or empires have been built on this or all of that's kind of faded out over time? You can't because opium is the foundation of the modern world. You can't, <laughs> uh, you can't take it out. Really? Uh, you literally cannot sift it out. I mean, uh, uh, a friend of mine, the historian Amar Farooqi has written a book called uh, um, Opium City, Bombay. You know, Bombay is entirely founded on opium. I mean, the whole fortunes of Bombay were found. But it's not just Bombay. You look at Calcutta. Uh, uh, you know, the great uh, families of 19th century Calcutta were really founded by opium traders. Uh, either they were, uh, um, you know, working as gomastas for opium traders, or they were themselves actually opium traders, like uh, Darukanath Thakur, you know, um, who f founded the Tagore family. One of the reasons why Rabindranath Tagore had such a powerful feeling of animosity towards his grandfather was that Tagore, above all people, knew very, very well, you know, uh, what... Uh, what opium was and what it had done, 
you know, to China, he has some wonderful writings, incredibly powerful writings, where he says, you know, that uh, we in India are poisoning our, um, uh, our brethren in China. He says that repeatedly. Tagore did not hold back on this at all. And similarly, you know, at the other end, uh, in Bombay, Dadabhai Nauroji, uh, who also came from a community uh, which had grown rich on uh, opium, and he was equally strident in uh, denouncing the opium trade. So there was a very, there was a very uh, important sort of understanding of this. But you know, it's not just India. What is so interesting is that, uh, you know, I've been, uh, I, I've been visiting these American universities, um, and it, so many of them, the endowments come entirely from opium. Uh, you know, uh, Brown University, uh, one of the major Ivy League universities, its endowment is largely, um, uh, you know, from A, from the slave trade, B, from uh, opium. And you see this across the board, all the Peabody museums across America, they were financed by opium. Uh, uh, the, the big opium merchants were great philanthropists, you know. One, the biggest opium trader uh, in, uh, in China in the 1840s was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's grandfather. You have to stop, Amitabh. All these uh, people are just, you know, this clay feet and clay knees and then clay hips and, you know, okay. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question away from the novel, but very much about you. We all know that writers lead schizophrenic lives, right? You guys spent years hunched over a table inhabiting characters there their pleasures, their perils, their past, their futures. And then the book is done, as it is now. And the most powerful lamp we have in cinema is the HMI lamp. And then suddenly the HMI lamp moves to you. And you know, you're, you're right there in the spotlight for the next few months. And it's, um, you have tours, you have readings, you have interviews, you have reviews, all of that. Do you look forward to any or all of this? Or is it otherwise? Uh, you're right about the uh, schizophrenic aspect, you know, I mean, uh, you know, even when I began my career as a writer, it wasn't like this. You know, uh, you sat, you wrote a book, the book came out, there were reviews, but that was about it, you know, I mean, <laughs> you never expected to be out there sort of talking to uh, hundreds of people. This is something that has happened uh, very recently. And yes, you know, for me, uh, this aspect of it, uh, you know, that aspect of it where I live with the book day by day, you know, often weeks go by, often months go by, I never see anyone but my, but my family, my wife and, you know. Sometimes, you know, when I'm in the middle of a book, I step out on the street and I look around and think, oh my God, there are people, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Real people. Real people. <laughs> Uh, so yes, I mean, writing a book is, you know, you go deep, deep, deep down into a deep well, uh, you know, and in that well, everything is very loud. It's very alive in your head, but it's only in your head that it's alive. And then you come out and there's this uh, whole busy world around you. And there are, as you say, these lights upon you. My, th you know, my project, what I try, what I've tried to do since the beginning of my writing career is that I want that spotlight to be on my books, not on me, because I'm not very interesting. My books are interesting, you know? So that's, uh, that's you know, what I always try for. My whole sort of uh, emphasis has always been that the books should be the stars, the books should be out there, the books should be read. And I think on the whole, more than most writers, I've succeeded in that, you know? But Amitav, you, you can't get away with this. The books are yours. They've come out of your mad head. And so they are, it's, it's all about you. So auto automatically, you will be the lightning rod for all the attention because everybody will want to keep finding out when you wrote about Diti, why did you discard her in the second book? And you know, all these kind of, it'll all be about, it, the, as it is, we live in a culture of very much a culture centered around personality and, and faces and people. So there's no way you can escape it. Do, uh, is it oppressive for you or is it somewhat refreshing after being anonymous for so many years in your study? See, it would be oppressive if I were, like you, uh, in uh, instantly recognizable, you know, but that's not the case. Uh, <clears throat> you know what happens? It's like this. A book comes out, for about two weeks I'm out there, you know, a little bit visible, and then I go away. And, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, what people don't realize, I think, is that to be a constant public presence, you really have to work at it. You have to go to the television stations, you have to go to, you know, do these constant interviews and all that. And, you know, I get my share of uh, those things, invitations, but I don't go because, uh, you know, it's not of interest to me. So after 
those two weeks are over, you know, pretty much I fade away again. And then after four years, I come back. But the books stay on, and people do, uh, you know, pay attention to the books. And uh, that's what matters to me. So I know that you're a tireless and vigilant campaigner uh, on climate change. And you've been, you know, we've talked about this privately so many times. And so I'm tempted to ask you this question. Tell, tell us about your sense of where book buying and reading is going with reference to this. I'm referring to the electronic book versus the physical book because we know as a campaigner for climate change, there are many ramifications to produce 500,000 hard, you know, paper copies as opposed to selling them electronically. So my question is, would you as a climate change activist or whatever you'd like to, however you'd like to refer to yourself, prefer to go completely electronic? And if so, would that work commercially for you? Uh, Rahul, I would not at all uh, describe myself as an activist or a campaigner. Fair enough. Uh, not at all, because, you know, uh, I know activists and campaigners. I know, the, the connotations are different, so yeah, I take uh, that back. Uh, I respect what they do, but, um, uh, you know, I know that I can't do that. Uh, I think climate change is the fundamental, most important question of our time. You know, it, um, it's, uh, it's absolutely sort of crucial to all of us. And, you know, what to me is so interesting is how we have reached this state of consciousness where this doesn't register on us. It doesn't register on us that Calcutta is a city which is incredibly vulnerable to climate change. You know, it's so vulnerable that one of the UN bodies which was asked to assess the risk uh, refused to do it on Calcutta because they said that uh, the risks are so great that we can't even compute them. You know, this city is below sea level. Um, I mean, in the event of a massive storm surge, which we fortunately we've not ha had yet, it would just be washed away, like Canning was washed away, you know, in a, storm, in a storm surge, just 10 years after it was founded. A man who lived in Calcutta, Henry Piddington, was one of the first uh, meteorologists to study storm surges. He predicted it, you know. There's a reason why, you know, uh, uh, in ancient times, people did not build big cities in the deltaic regions. You know, if you look at the old cities of Bengal, then none of them built in these deltaic regions. Why? Because people knew that these were very, very dangerous places in which to build, uh, in which to build uh, uh, cities. My own uh, father's uh, uh, village, you know, uh, which is in Bangladesh, in Bikrampur district, in the 1850s, uh, you know, it was washed away. And it was ever since then that my family, uh, you know, started migrating. So, yeah, I mean, I think uh, for me, uh, climate, the environment, uh, these are sort of profoundly important. And I've been working, uh, I've been writing about the Sundarbans. I've been, have, a, have had this close relationship with the Sundarbans, going back to my uncles who were, you know, uh, who were foresters there. And, you know, anyone who's spent time in the Sundarbans has, knows that entire islands are disappearing. There's an invasion of salt water, which is happening on a massive scale, driving people off what were, even 10 years ago, uh, rice-producing lands. So I think more than any other place in the world, we in the Bengal Delta are facing ecological catastrophe. You know? And the degree to which this, uh, <laughs> this knowledge, this reality, is effaced or obscured, 